all set to go. All right. <clears throat> Welcome to a meeting of the Town of Barstable Comprehensive Financial Advisory Committee. Today is March 13th, 2023. This meeting is being recorded by the Town of Barstable and will be broadcast on Channel 18 after the meeting has concluded. The agenda for this meeting is available on the town website. Um, Chuck, will you please call the roll? Well, Lillian? Here. Jackie? Here. Wendy? Here. Neil? Here. And do you prefer Chris or Christopher? Chris is fine. Okay. Thank you. Chris? I'm here. <laughs> Hector? I'm here. And Chuck is here, so we're good. That's good. We're all here. And thank you very much for all coming. Um, today, we welcome Chris as a new member of CFAC. And Chris, if you would uh, give us a introductory uh, remarks of who you are and why you're interested in CFAC. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up on the Cape. I live in Marston's Mills with my wife and our four kids. Um, I got involved last year. I actually ran for state Senate. Um, didn't win, but I wanted to get involved in another way. So I decided to apply to the town to join a committee. Um, and partially for scheduling reasons, the financial committee lined up for me best because I have to work, you know, an eight to five job. So I noticed your meetings are usually 6 p.m. So that worked for me. And uh, I'm excited to get involved. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. <clears throat> and so what I'll do is I'll ask the other members of the committee to introduce themselves so that you will become acquainted with who we are. And we will start with Hector, who is our vice chair. He's somewhere out there. So um, I'm Hector Gunther. I'm, I moved to the Cape in 2017 from Connecticut. Um, my background is in corporate finance. I worked in banking in Manhattan for a lot of years, um, covering large corporations. So I was interested to join CFAC, what was it, five years ago, four years ago, because I'd had no, no or little exposure to municipal finance. So I've learned a whole lot from Mark and the other members of the committee um, over the last five years that I've been on this committee. Thank you. Chuck? <clears throat> Uh, Chuck McKenzie. Um, I spent 40 years in uh, investment management for institutions and joined CFAC a couple of years ago. And uh, it's been terrific. It's a great way to get a feel for what the town is doing and to try to participate and um, offering opinions about some of the things the town is doing. So very glad you're uh, here with us. Glad to be here. Thank you. Wendy? Hi, I'm Wendy Solomon. Um, moved to the Cape full time um, about three plus years ago. Um, always summered here uh, for about 35 years and um, worked in the investment arena for about 20, 20 plus years. Raised my three kids and uh, and uh, then became involved in, in this town committee. So it's been great to understand the nuances and, and learn from everybody else. Thank you. Neil? Uh, good evening. My name is Neil Kleinfeld. Uh, I live in Marston Mills as well. Um, moved here about uh, actually th exactly three years ago. Uh, wife had family here. Um, I'm retired now, and before that, spent most of my career in management consulting uh, to global uh, firms. Jackie, somewhere? <laughs> my name is Jackie Johnson, and I am a pastor here in town. And I wanted to get involved in and participate in things that the town was doing because there were questions that people would ask or ways that people would um, want me to get involved that I did not understand. So I thought this was one of the great ways to get involved and share and offer uh, some of my experiences and gain from what the town is doing. Oh, my name is Jackie Johnson. Thank you. Um, I'm Lillian. Um, I'm an economist by training. 
<clears throat> and I spent 35 years as a you know, political and legislative advisor to candidates and uh, incumbents. I've, been, I've had my house here on the Cape for about 25 years, and I've been a member of CFAC since 2013. And now we have our major guru, Mark Milne. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Uh, welcome to CFAC. And pleasure to meet you. Um, <clears throat> here in the mills, your neighbor, um, lived on River Road for 25 years. Uh, and I've been the town, town's director of finance for the past 25 years. Prior to that, I worked in the town of Amherst and I was in private accounting uh, CPA firm for several years before that. And um, plan to retire here in the town of Barnstable. So it's a great place to live. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. So that's who we are. <clears throat> um, we'll move on to business. Uh, the first is the review of the 24 capital plan. So <clears throat> Hector is the chair of that uh, subcommittee. So Hector, would you like to give us an update of the proposed CIP report and your schedule? Sure. Um, so the, the update from the CIP subcommittee is actually item number two on the agenda. Would you like me to, I, I could talk briefly about it, then we could talk about the, the 2024 capital plan. Mark, were you going to address that? Yes, I'll address that. Yeah, sure. all right. So the subcommittee, um, the CIP capital investment um, plan, uh, capital improvement plan subcommittee, Chris, uh, we're on um, every year we write, we have two subcommittees, one which writes a report to the town management, to the town council on the, on the annual upcoming capital budget. And uh, there's a second uh, <clears throat> report written by a different subcommittee on the operating budget. And um, the capital bu budget subcommittee is comprised of Lillian Chuck, Wendy and myself, uh, we met by Zoom last week and we, we divided up the topics that we're going to address. Um, in brief, they, they include um, the comprehensive wastewater management plan, which is of course the biggest, biggest uh, single uh, <clears throat> project that this town has going on. Um, then there'll be another section on the the, the general uh, general fund. There'll be a section on enterprise funds. Um, so some some of our activities in town, like the waste transfer station and others, are run on the golf course, um, are run on an enterprise fund basis. So they're paid for by fees from the users as opposed to general tax revenues. So that's that's a third section, and then there'll be a, a there, there'll be an introductory section written to discuss the methodology that the town goes through. It's an extensive methodology to, mm -hmm. uh, to um, come up with the capital budget recommendations, which are submitted to the town manager uh, for his, his uh, support. And then the final section is uh, an overview of the, the 2024, the five-year outlook for the capital improvement plan. Um, uh, submitted by the town. Um, we can get you all these documents um, if you're interested in sort of getting up to speed on, on what's involved. The, the capital budget plan is, is this. It's a, it's a couple hundred pages. It's a, it's a weighty tome. Um, and that's printed every year. Um, so our, our subcommittee met last week and we have a we have two more meetings planned um, this week and next week, Thursday night this week and Wednesday next week. And then at the next CFAC meeting, two weeks from tonight, we'll have a fairly final draft of our subcommittee's report, which will be uh, circulated to the full CFAC. And I suspect that that will be one of the items for discussion on the, on the full CFAC uh, uh, report uh, on the full CFAC meeting two weeks from tonight. 
our deadline, Chris, is that uh, we have to have a, f a final report of view, uh, voted and approved by this committee by April 10th, I think it is. Yeah. Um, and after the committee votes, then it's submitted to the town council. And Mark Milne is, is a key resource in all of our subcommittees work. Um, and you'll quickly realize how important Mark is to the, to the, to the overall CFAC. So that's, that's my update. I, does anyone have any questions? Uh, can I get a copy of that at town hall or the budget you just held up? Yeah. I think you can get a hard copy in, in Mark's office. Yes, I have hard copies for all committee members. I think only Hector and Lillian so far have picked one up, but I have copies for all of you. Okay, so just great. give me an email or give me a call and let me know when you can come by and I'll have a book ready for you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, and just one more comment. Um, at our at our CIP meeting a few nights ago, we we talked about the format for the report and we we decided pretty much to emulate the format that we developed last year for the capital improvement report. So we'll be following that. And the, the total document will be eight or 10 pages altogether, including uh, charts and exhibits. Thank you, Hector. Uh, Mark, do you wanna <clears throat> review the proposed capital plan? Sure, yeah, I just wanted to take a few moments to give everybody, uh, particularly those members who aren't on the CIP subcommittee, um, an idea of what's included in the budget for next year. Um, also, that entire capital planning document is available on the town's website right at the front page under the in the new section, as well as under the finance section. Um, so let me just share my screen here first, um, and I'll show you um, what's included in the plan. Okay, can everybody can everybody see this? Yep. Yeah, it looks mm -hmm. good. The yeah. Enterprise Fund so recommendations. Clear, yeah. Okay. Um, so altogether, we have 54 projects coming forward for a total of about $68 million. Um, and beginning here with the Enterprise Funds, we have several projects for the Airport Enterprise Fund. Um, most of it is going to be paid for eventually with grants from the FAA and the Mass Department of Transportation. However, we do have we do, we are authorizing bond issues. Um, to fund these projects initially, but once we receive those grants that we're anticipating, we will go back and rescind these bond authorizations. So we'll never borrow this money to do these airport projects. Um, they will ultimately be paid, 90 to 95% of the costs will be paid by state with state and federal funds. Uh, so there are several projects there. Um, the Gulf Enterprise Fund has three projects. We're gonna pay for it is being proposed that we'll pay for all three of those projects using their cash reserves. We have one project, the final design project for the relocation of the Sandy Neck Gate House and, and access, ORB access road. There's one project there to be paid from their reserves. We have one project in the um, Marina Enterprise Fund for the Prince Cove Marina Improvement Designs. Um, and that's gonna be paid from with a uh, transfer from their reserves, as well as a balance left over and a previous appropriation, which is no longer needed from a project that they've completed and it has remaining funds. Um, we have one project for the HYCC Enterprise Fund, the Highness Youth and Community Center for uh, continuation of mechanical improvements out there. Um, that's 1.7 million. That'll be a bond issue to pay for those uh, mechanical improvements. Uh, moving in on to the enterprise funds here, we have the solid waste facility with two projects paid from their reserves and a small balance left over from existing appropriations for projects that have been completed. So those total $100,000. Then we get into some of the larger enterprise funds, the water supply enterprise fund with $7.2 million of proposed projects, most of it being financed with bond issues, um, six projects there, and then three projects for the sewer enterprise fund, totaling about $7 million. And again, most of that being paid for with bond issues. So about $21 million in total for um, enterprise fund operations. Moving into the general fund, uh, we have 
four infrastructure projects, most of that being our annual public road maintenance program. Uh, we've been appropriating three point, over $3 million for several years now. We're trying to grow that a little bit every year. But this year we held it level um, in anticipation of waiting for the final decision as to how we're gonna pay for our comprehensive wastewater management plan. But still, we still level funded with fiscal year 23's appropriation amount of three million seven hundred and fifty thousand, and these four projects will all be paid for from reserves, no borrowing. Um, we have three facility projects, including uh, roof analysis and repairs at Town Hall, um, some mechanical and cooling upgrades at the school administration building, and a Department of Public Works um, office administration building expansion due to the additional um, staff that we've brought on board to manage our comprehensive wastewater management plan. We need space to house these employees. Um, we have six projects listed under our waterways category, including some boat ramps, uh, uh, fish passages, uh, three fish runs in this particular area that we're looking at. We do, this is just design money for those fish runs. Subsequent construction asks will come in later years and we anticipate the Nat uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service to participate in grant funding to fund the majority of the construction costs associated with those fish runs. And then we have a, a dinghy dock out at uh, McCarthy's Landing, which needs to be replaced. Um, we, we found out a couple of years ago that the dinghy dock that we had out there was was in disrepair and it needed to be replaced. And it was, it was actually, it wasn't permitted. Um, it had been installed decades ago and without the proper permits. And so we're going through that process of getting that permitted and we're gonna replace that with a brand new dinghy dock. Um, and then we have some design money in here for the Katuit downtown dock improvements. One of our major uh, highly utilized docks in town down in Katuit and this is the design funds only. The construction money will come next fiscal year once we finish the design. We have a sense as to how much the construction will cost to replace that heavily utilized dock, um, which we're, we're looking to expand. It's uh, the ability for it to accept larger weights on that dock as well. Um, then we have three water quality projects. Uh, we've really made an effort to try to continue our program to improve freshwater bodies in town. Um, and this year's round of funding will include some management plans, um, monitoring and management plans for our freshwater bodies, a continuing analysis that we're doing to determine what we need to do to improve the water quality in many of our freshwater ponds. An alum treatment in Mystic Lake, which we've identified as the best solution for that. Um, particular body of water that need where we need to um, treat that treat that lake to avoid the continuous um, uh, cy cyanobacteria problems that we've had out there, and then um, some municipal separate storm sewer system um, funding or MS4 as it's referred to. This is really to deal with stormwater runoff. Um, a lot of stormwater runoff runs into freshwater bodies or sensitive environmental areas, and we need to redirect. Uh, we, have, we have many, many stormwater runoff catch basins around town, and we're going through a comprehensive analysis of, of identifying those locations and where we can make improvements to make sure that the, the stormwater that they collect appropriately gets channeled in the right areas. <clears throat> and then we have several school facility projects totaling four and a half million dollars. Um, we're using almost $2 million of reserves um, to fund these projects, the biggest one being the continuation of field upgrades at the Principal High School for a million dollars. We also have a campus-wide door and window replacement program in progress, um, and this is another million dollars. Um, and then we've identified $680,000 of uh, leftover or existing appropriations that we will no longer use for what they were originally intended for and instead use them to help pay for the West Village's elementary carpet replacement program. That carpet out in the building is, is well over 15 years, I think 20 years old, and it's time for that to be replaced. Um, so it's about $12 million in general fund projects in total. And then we have our comprehensive wastewater management plan. 
Here we have five projects totaling about $33 million for fiscal year 24. Um, existing resources, well, we have existing resources to pay for all of the projects listed for the fiscal year 24 round, including fund reserves of 2.65 million um, to pay cash for four projects. And then the debt service that we anticipate on the bond issue fund the sewer construction along the, the um, CW route or the uh, Park City wind route um, will be, that, that service can also be covered with the existing resources that we've created for this program. Um, so we can do all of this within existing resources and that's $33 million or almost half of our capital program, entire capital program for fiscal year 24, which is about, again, $68 million. So I just wanted to briefly go over the committee, what we're planning on doing with the capital program. And again, that, um, that book will be available. It's unavailable. It's available on their website as well as available in my office if you want to pick up a hard copy. Um, but, uh, yeah, if there's any questions on any of those projects, feel free to reach out to me. Yeah, and, and Chris, just for your background, when you get the booklet, what Mark just went over is tab five of the booklet, which is which is headed the town manager's recommendations. And those are the those are the overview pages. And then the rest of the tab, which is about a hundred pages, goes through a detail of each of those. Okay, great. Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions or comments of Mark? Thank you very much for that overview. Um, okay, moving on to the um, fiscal 24 operating budget, Mark. You're, you're muted. I'm sorry about that. I'm gonna share my screen here again. Okay. Okay, can everybody see that? Is that the agenda yes. you're looking at? Are you, are you seeing the general fund appropriation budget projection? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. So, um, yeah, some good news from the state recently. Um, Governor Healy's budget um, included additional Chapter 70 funding. Um, this is the third year out of a six year plan, originally a seven year plan, but it was shrunk to six years uh, for implementing what's called the Student Opportunity Act. Um, and this, what the Student Opportunity Act was, um, is the, they create several years ago, the state created a foundation budget review committee to look at what the cost of associ uh, associated with educating children in public school systems in Massachusetts. And they made several adjustments to the calculation of what's called the foundation budget to recognize the cost of educating children in Massachusetts and public school systems. The biggest changes included recognizing the uh, health insurance costs have um, mm -hmm. all paced inflation typically on an annual basis and that there were um, additional um, additional spending requirements associated with educating English language learners as well as other uh, demographics within the student population in particular low-income um, children and they built these cost factors into their foundation budget and they created what was called the Student Opportunity Act that would recognize and increase costs associated with funding education um, and that cities and towns are going to have to um, spend a higher minimum amount per pupil to provide an adequate education. Now they weren't gonna place all of that additional cost onto the local communities they were making a commitment to provide additional funding through the Chapter 78 program to help offset that additional spending requirement. And so they did that um, back in 2021. The first year they implemented it, they were supposed to implement it in 2021, but because of COVID, um, they postponed its implementation. And so the first time they actually 
provided additional funding was last fiscal year in 2022. Um, and they shrank it from seven years to six years. In 2023, we saw a significant increase in our chapter 78, which was year two of six in the implementation. We received a $5 million bump in chapter 78 last year. Yep. And in fiscal year 2023, we are now looking at here $24 million. That's substantial. Substantial increase, which is wow. $6 million more than what we were to receive in fiscal year 23. Now we anticipate that this will, this has not been approved by the state yet. Of course, the legislature has to put their budget together um, and then um, it'll come then they'll vote on the overall budget. But typically what happens is the governor's budget is a benchmark and the legislature usually approves the amount that the budget, the, the governor recommends or a higher amount. It's been our experience. Um, so we're pretty confident that we will receive um, this additional funding under the Chapter 70 program. So that presents to us some an opportunity um, to provide those that funding for our local school system um, to address those needs. And part of the reason why our funding has gone up so much um, is twofold. Number one, we had an increase of 109 students from 23 to 24 um, that they're using to calculate our foundation budget based on our October 2022 enrollment data. Um, so when you have the number, your overall number of students increasing, the, the way the foundation budget formula works is you, is you got to spend so much per pupil. So when you have an increase in students, your, your, your necessary spending requirements go up. Number two is we have seen a significant increase, particularly in the economic disadvantaged population within our school district. And when those categories, when that category goes up, as well as our English language learners, that they've also gone up, there's incremental spending, additional incremental spending that you have to incur um, in order to provide them an, an adequate education. And so um, that drove our foundation budget or our minimum required spending on education to go up by $9 million um in fiscal year 24 according to the chapter 70 funding program formula so they're not going to put that whole nine million dollar burden on the town of barnstable um our local required contribution towards funding that additional increase of nine million is three million um they they adjust our local contribution by what's known as our municipal revenue growth factor and that ended up resulting in the town of Barnesville having to commit three million more um, in local funding to to provide for education, and they would close the gap between the required additional spending of nine million and what the local contribution is of three million. So that's your six million dollars in Chapter seventy eight. Um, and so that was the good news um, as far as uh, additional revenue coming to the town, which can be used to provide much of that additional spending that we're gonna be required to under the new Student Opportunity Act. So if I go right down to the bottom line um, here, we have $10 million of net revenue available for operating budget. Our total gross revenue is increasing $13 million. And I sent this projection off to the committee members last, uh, last week. We have so we have $13 million in new revenue growth, $3 million increase in overall fixed costs. So when we reduce our revenue growth by the $3 million in fixed cost increases, that leaves us $10 million for operating budgets, available for operating budgets. And with the 60-40 revenue sharing agreement that we've had in place, 60% um, of 6 million of that is dedicated to school operations and 4 million to municipal operations. And so these are what the maximum budgets could look like without using any reserves to balance operating budgets. Um, our, school, our local school budget could go up $6 million and our municipal budgets collectively could go up $4 million um, over what the fiscal year 23 amounts are. And that's using no reserves to balance operating budgets.
Uh, so it gives us some flexibility, a lot more budget flexibility than what we were originally anticipating um, at the beginning of the budget process this year. Back in October, when we presented the budget, we were only expecting about a $600,000 increase in Chapter 78. Well, it's 10 times that um, based on the based and mainly most of that is attributable to, again, growth in student population and particularly growth in the sub components of that population. Mark, when will the state make its uh, final decision on that increased allocation? State budgets usually get passed in late June, early July, Hector. Okay. But but you got you and your colleagues feel feel like this money is definitely coming our way. Yes. Absolutely. It would, it would take a major, major economic event for the state to back off on what the governor is proposing right now. And I wouldn't be surprised to see some 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 enhancements to what the state does uh, for local aid, particularly, I think, in the charter school funding area. Mm -hmm. um, because in that projection I sent you, I think you'll notice there is a pretty sizable reduction in charter school aid that they're providing for the town of Barnesville. And you know, we're hoping that you know they'll put some more money towards funding um, charter school reimbursement aid. And so we'll see, but um, yeah, we're pretty confident this is, this is gonna, this is real money. That's great. So that, that's all I wanted to present on the operating budget to give you a, an update on you know, what we're looking at as we go forward and develop our um, operating budgets for fiscal year 24. The school department has a budget workshop this Wednesday night. The superintendent will be presenting um, the school department's uh, budget proposal to the school committee. Um, we anticipate it to be about a $6 million increase, which is what we can afford um, looking uh, uh, going by that budget projection I just shared with you. Um, so we, we do expect that, that that will be around where the school committee will ultimately approve their recommended budget for fiscal year 24, which will then come to the town manager who will include their, their, their approved budget in his budget submission to the town council. I think you're muted. Sorry, was Neil, were you saying something? No, I was saying something. Oh. I was asking Mark when he thought the town manager would have his budget projections, his recommended budget. So his recommended budget is scheduled to go to... Town Council on, I believe it's early May. Okay. Uh, let me look at the calendar here. Uh, May 9th, he's submitting. May 9th? Budget, May 9th. Okay. Uh, so when should CFAX report? We had originally... Uh, scheduled it for May 15th, but yes. if it's May 9th, we won't have that much time. Um, so I've been providing you information as we go along here. Thank uh, you. We're gonna we're using this budget projection that I just presented to you and provided to the committee as the budget projection to build our operating budgets. So I think for the next few meetings, you you may want to consider what departments you want to bring in and speak to. Yes. Um, about their budgets uh, request, their additional funding request for fiscal year 24, so you can start developing that report. Um, Thank you very much. I think that's a very good idea. Uh, <clears throat> I have been the uh, chair of the Operating Budget Committee for many, many, many years. And um, starting this year, Chuck is going to take over. We are going to... Um, benefit from his enthusiasm and his energy and all of his years in finance. 
And so I will turn it over to Chuck. And this see is, what another, you this is one, another one of those things I was told <laughs> I volunteered for. So, um, yes. Yeah, so uh, um, I think, Mark, when do we need to um, when do we need to tell the uh, uh, departments that we'd like to speak with uh, that we'd like to get an audience with them? How much time do they need, and when should um, those meet? Yeah, if we could just give them a week's head, a week a heads up in a week. Time frame. So your next meeting okay. is the 27th. Um, so if you decide tonight, I think uh, definitely you want the school department in. I think you need to hear the school department story. Um, and I would start right off with the school department. I can get a hold of the superintendent and invite them in for your next meeting on the 27th. If she's available, um, we can have them in and we can you can have a conversation with the school department and you can and we, I can provide you their budget presentation too, um, that they'll be providing Wednesday night to the school committee. So you'll have that ahead of time. And then we can have um, uh, school superintendent um, as well in the 27th meeting, which will give you much of the information or probably all the information you're going to need to draft that part of your report. Okay. And, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna, I was just gonna, um remind everybody that um, Chuck and I and Chris and Neil and Jackie will be part of this operating budget commit subcommittee. And last year we dealt with general fund, fixed costs, schools, enterprise funds, CWMP, DPW and police. And if anybody is new to the subcommittee, and would like to get a copy of our last year's operating budget subcommittee report, uh, please let us know and we'll send it to you. Yeah, I'd like maybe, to have a copy if you could send me one, please. Maybe you could circulate it to the entire CFAC, Moran. I wouldn't mind seeing one as well. You mean you don't have it in your... Uh... I may have it. I can send it I'm, out. I'm kidding you. Yeah. I have it, a huge is it on the is it on the town website? It or? is. Yeah, it's on the yes, website. Yeah. Okay, I'll get it off the town website. <clears throat> and basically what we did, and I don't want to I don't want to impinge on on Chuck's chairmanship, but what we did was to allow the members to select the areas that they feel most comfortable with. And I don't want to pressure Neil, but he has been doing a lot of work delving into the school budget. Neil. <laughs> I'm just trying to learn. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all learning all the time. But, but whatever you think is uh, you need, uh, please volunteer me. No, I, I, I'll leave it now to Chuck. It's in his, it's in his court. Oh, um... I heard an offer, so I accept. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think um, a couple of things, I think. So, Mark, um, I think having schools in on March, uh, the next March meeting would be great if the agenda will provide for it. I'm not sure what we're going to need to talk about CIP-wise, but that would be a, a great start. <clears throat> um, the other thing is I think most of the uh, operating budget committee this year is going to be newer people. So um, it's going to be, uh, I don't want to put too much pressure on them to decide which groups we should talk to because they might not have perspective. That said, there's something that's of particular interest we should talk about. And maybe um, if, if we, uh, are we going to the website to uh, get a copy of last year's or is somebody going to send it out just so we all know what we're doing? It's just on the website. I just sent it, Chuck. Everybody has it. You oh, okay. 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 So, okay. Thank you. Maybe I just ask then the other people on the operating budget committee, if they look at the last report, if something grabs you, either there's a topic that you like that you think we should update, or maybe one we didn't cover um, that you think we should, just make a suggestion. We still have some time. Mm -hmm. um, 
And Mark, of course, um, I'd also ask you, uh, you've always been good with your recommendations. Um, schools got it. Um, seems hard to not include CWMP. Um, but who we talk to and uh, um, uh, what we do, I figure we can, we can um, hammer that out maybe at the next meeting after the discussion with the schools and after people have had a chance to look at last year's report. Yeah, 90, 90 to 95% of the budget is schools, police, DPW, and those fixed costs. Right. So if we continue to tackle those areas, you're, you're looking at 90 95% of the operating budget. I just want to add a word to the new members who are going to be on the operating budget committee. We're not going to leave you high and dry. We're here to guide you and to help. So we're not going to hang you out there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> any other any other comments? Well, you know, um, Chuck, <clears throat> CWMP's last year's budget was the first time that they had an operating budget. And yes. so, yeah. So we may want to incorporate that with the DPW. Yep. Yeah. Just a suggestion. Yep. Nope. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? I went through the last year's report, and I think it's very good. I'm wondering, are there any things that the town council to whom this report will also go, um, that they have any special interests in that we should be aware of? Other than CWMP? Yeah, I, just overall. Are there any topics that are, you know, top of mind at the town council that we should know that we should also focus on or within, say, schools, something that we should focus on? I can try to answer that, Lillian. Um, okay. I think definitely... Um, the Student Opportunity Act that the school department is, um, you know, uh, implementing um, in accordance with state guidelines. I think that is a major area. I think that will pique the town council's interest. Um, that's so. That's one area having school superintendent in to talk to us about um, what that means from an operating standpoint within the school department. Uh, number one and number two, I think the ongoing discussion that we're we're having with the council on how to fund the comprehensive wastewater management plan um, in the long run. Um, we'll be having another workshop at the first meeting in April with the town council, um, updating them on the financial plan for this next five-year phase of the comprehensive wastewater management plan you know and we've been talking about the possibility of a debt exclusion and what does that look like on um the budget and for on the tax bills for example and i presented some of that information in january at the last workshop we had with the town council so we're going to be updating that and reviewing that with the council again. So I, I think that's an area that is going to be creating a lot of focus on how we go forward in funding the next five year round of capital projects of, of the CWMP. Mm -hmm. Mark, when you say the next five years, are you referring to 20, fiscal 24 to fiscal 28? That's exactly. what? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you notice we have close to three hundred million dollars in capital projects yeah. for the CWMP. Right. Most of that, you know, being construction for some sewer expansions, and right. um, obviously we we're gonna we're gonna have to borrow the money to do that kind of construction in a five year time frame. We don't have cash reserves laying around to pay for that. Um, so that means the issuance of bonds. Um, trying to go to the state's revolving loan fund to achieve, you know, the favorable interest rates and principal subsidies that we could get through that program. Um, but at the end of the day, you're looking at tens of millions of dollars of annual loan payments to do 
finance construction in the 300 million range. And so what's the operating budget impact? And that, you know, that's, that's and $15 million a year in debt service payments. And that's a fixed cost. You yeah, have to pay it that. Sure is. So yeah. don't, you can't cut that in any given year. So, you know, we, we lose our budget flexibility once we start allocating more of our budget towards fixed payments like debt service. Um, and so how, how can we adjust that budget flexibility and provide um, for those debt service payments while protecting services, public safety services, public works? Um, education. Well, one of the proposals that we made was to for us to consider a debt exclusion override um, to pay for, similar to what we've done in the past for, for large school projects, um, where you would you would exclude the annual loan payment on those bonds from the Proposition Two and a Half tax levy limitations, and allow that to be raised as additional taxes on the tax levy. We showed what the financial impact would be. Um, on the tax bills of, of such action. So there'll be more talk about that to come and we'll have right. to- if, have if, we do, if we do issue bonds under the, the debt exclusion, assume, assuming the council authorizes such a vote and it passes, what will be the tenor of those bonds? Do you expect 20 years? 30, most likely. 30. 30. Yeah, because they're so large. I mean, it's, to, to accelerate the amortization over a 20 year period would have a, a larger tax bill impact. So right, admitting right, that, like, right. like you or I, you know, when we buy a house, most people choose a 30 year mortgage as opposed to a 20 or a 15 for the right. cash. And, and that's what we would do with projects like this, because these are the largest public works projects that we're ever going to do. Um, right. Typically school bonds, you know, we've, we've done 20 years um, but you could go as high as 30. They now yeah. allow us to amortize over 30 years. And so that's likely what we'll do is a 30 year amortization mm -hmm. um, for all of these. For the larger okay. ones, anyways, the smaller ones, we could probably shorten the amortization period to 20 years. But definitely. And, and just a follow up question. Um, and I realize you, we're only thinking ahead in five year increments because it's pretty hard to forecast. Um, with any specificity out beyond five years, but you would expect, given given the magnitude of the CWMP spending, that there will be another debt exclusion mm. vote in five years for another round of of uh, spending. You know that that is a lot can change. You know, in years six through ten, maybe new technology has been developed that allows us to do mm -hmm. some innovative alternative things on site. And so it's, it's hard to tell at this point, but certainly if, we, you know, if year six through 10, we're looking at another 300 million in capital projects and nothing else has changed. Yeah, we're, we're probably going to need another debt exclusion. Um, okay. it's, it's, it's again, these are the largest public works projects we've ever seen in our history, probably ever. We'll see in the history of the town. Right. This, the cost of this program, Cape Wide, rivals the cost of replacing those bridges going over the canal. Yeah. Mark, I, I've i been thinking, is the tax revenue the only source of income or revenue that the town thinks would be able to help to offset the, the debt? Raising taxes, is there another another means of revenue? That so could... the, other the other major component of revenue that available for this program um, has been um, and will likely remain to be the state revolving loan fund. Um, any federal assistance that has been provided for clean water and drinking water projects have been funneled through the state's revolving loan fund. Direct grants are not out there. We can't get grants for multi-million dollar projects to reduce the pay for the cost of this construction. What we do get are low interest loans, sometimes 0% loans through the state revolving loan fund. And sometimes they provide principal subsidies uh, for those loans. So we borrow 10 million, for example, but we only have to pay back 9 million because we get a 10% principal subsidy. Okay. Um, but those, that's, that's the only other major funding source other than taxes and sewer assessments. 
And we, we proposed a sewer assessment. The council approved the sewer assessment to pay to help pay for this, but it was capped at $10,000. And so, um, you know, capped at $10,000 means uh, most of the project costs is going to be borne by taxes. It's going to, it has to be paid through taxes or low interest loans that we get through the state revolving loan fund. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, there's, there's no other revenue source out there. You, you may have heard some people claim that there are billions of dollars available through ARPA funds and bipartisan infrastructure funds. Well, all the money, and I'll send you the presentation that we got from the Department of Environmental Protection. To date, the state of Massachusetts received about $5 billion in bipartisan infrastructure funds, so they're going to receive that over the next five years. But only about $60 million a year goes to the state revolving loan fund for clean wow. water. $60 where, million a year. Where does the rest of it go? Housing, other initiative, transportation projects, MBTA. Wow. Um, <clears throat> it's, there aren't billions of dollars for this program, but there have been some some comments, I think, that have been floated publicly saying that people have said that, you know, there's a lot of money at the federal and state levels to pay for this. It's not there. It's not materializing. Um, it's very limited as to what's been going to the state revolving loan fund. And so that's $60 million for fiscal year 24 to the state revolving loan fund. 351 cities and towns plus special districts are fighting for that. They're competing for that. And they won't even pay for all of the fiscal year 25 projects. Um, the MWRA on an annual basis submits tens of millions of dollars of project funding requests to the state revolving loan fund. They're much bigger than we are. Um, so it's just not materializing, unfortunately. Um, we have been in talks with state officials and trying to get the state to direct more of these federal dollars to the state revolving loan fund so we can get bigger subsidies and low interest loans through them to help finance this. Um, so we're in, we're still communicating with them, sharing ideas about how they could help us more um, than what they have to date. So who actually applies for funds for the state revolving fund on behalf of the town? Is that the council or representatives? It's the town administration. We do it. We, we, okay. yeah, we, have, we take our projects every year. We take our clean water projects and our drinking water projects and we send them up to DEP and we ask them to consider putting us on the list or intended use plan list to help finance these projects for us through their state revolving loan fund. And, and we've gotten a lot of projects financed through them and we've received some principal subsidies and low interest loans, some of them being 0% um, over the past several years for projects. And we're gonna to continue to do that. We're gonna put every single project that we have, whether it's for clean water sewers or drinking water um, and send them up to the state every single year and ask them to, to find, consider financing this. But it's a competitive process. And right. they receive hundreds of applications from communities and districts across the state on an annual basis, and they don't have the resources to fund them all. So they have a rank, a scoring system that, and they rank the projects. But one of the things that we're fighting for through DEP's ranking process is categorically approve all Cape Cod sewer expansion projects as being listed on that IUP and eligible for state revolving loan funds, especially if DEP is gonna go through and propose new regulations requiring property owners to upgrade their Title V systems. And we're addressing this aggressively by putting, by building on our public sewer infrastructure, categorically approve these projects then and help mm -hmm. us clean the water on, in Cape Cod. So we're, we're still fighting that fight and we hope that we can get, we can win and get these projects all listed on their intended mm -hmm. use plan every year, make them a priority. Okay. And then um, yeah, I was just going to say, Jackie, um, Mark, it, it's probably worth mentioning that there are other, in addition to sewer assessments, there's a local meals tax, local rooms tax, um, and be, among the between those, and 
fiscal 23, I think we forecast about $4.8 million to go to CWMP from those, those sources. But that's a small amount compared to the scale of the spending that we have. Mark, isn't that correct? Yes, thank you, Hector. There, there has been, you know, we, we, back in 2010, we started to identify resources that we could dedicate to this program. And anytime the state legislature authorized local communities to implement any changes in local taxing, we grabbed that and we dedicated it for this particular purpose. So they allowed us to go up on the local rooms tax from 4% to 6%. We took that 2% increase and dedicated it to fund this program. They allowed us to implement a local meals tax. We took that and dedicated it, 100% of it, to this program. The local rooms tax recently became applicable to short-term rentals. We dedicated all of that to this program. So when an opportunity comes up where a new tax or a new revenue source materializes, we have taken that opportunity to dedicate it to this program, knowing that we've had this large um, unfunded liability coming down the road. And we started that 13 years ago. Wow. Uh, Mark, uh, just, just another thought, um, besides probably having a team that would brainstorm some of the ways that the town could generate revenues um, I, I'm not in favor of raising my taxes. I'm just not. But what if the state um, allocates money to school funding? Um, could we shift um, the funding that we have for schools or take that funding and instead of applying it to the schools, we could allow the state to supply the funding for the schools and then that which we would have used for the schools, we use it for the CWMP. Yes, yes, and that's a great point, Jackie. And that's what we're looking at and that's what we're gonna be presenting in a, on the April meeting is that we have an opportunity to do that as a result of this additional state aid that we're receiving from the Chapter 70 program. It creates, again, like I said earlier, more budget flexibility. So right. now maybe we can take another million dollars or $2 million of annual tax revenue that normally would have gone to our operating budgets and directed towards this program right. as a result of the state's increased commitment to help us fund education. So yeah. we're looking at that opportunity as well. Yeah, but yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's no magic wand that we can wave to, to create a enough revenue sources um, for this particular program due to the magnitude of it. But when we were updating our area-wide 208 plans, you know, 15 years ago, we started this process. Um, we went forward trying to put together a plan that would say 50% of the resources the town would provide and the other 50% would be provided from the state and federal government, 25 from state, 25 from the feds. Well, between all the revenue sources that we've identified to date, we've achieved our 50% match. We can provide half the funding for this program. The state and federal government haven't stepped up. We're not getting the money directed towards those state revolving loan funds to, to come up with their share, their 50% uh, share. That's uh, but Cape Cod, it, and, 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 and it's just an opinion, perhaps this is probably not even the place to brainstorm it, but Cape Cod seems to be one of the places that are that is touted as having the resources that are necessary um, to be one of the, the strongest, most prolific towns in the Commonwealth. Um, so because of that, the state may not want to entertain, you know, putting more resources here. Probably we could find ways within the town to generate our own income and become self-sufficient. I'm just. Well, yeah, you know, I understand what you're saying, but you know, that's often what the, their argument is with the chapter 70 funding formula is that, you know, you have tremendous property wealth on Cape Cod. Right. So the only way to tap into that property wealth is through the property tax levy. Okay. But you're limited as to what you can raise annually through the property tax levy because of Proposition Two and a Half. 
So the only way to tap into that additional taxing capacity that we have, and we have a lot of it, we have a lot of additional taxing capacity, but the only way to do that is to get the voters to approve allowing you to do so. And then your property taxes go up. <laughs> Not everybody, we have a lot of property wealth, but there are a lot of people out there who are of average means who don't, they don't have the property wealth like a waterfront property owners. So one of the things that the town council has done over the years is they've approved annually a residential exemption, which shifts more of the property tax levy to second homeowners and homeowners who have a higher property wealth or higher property values. So that's one of the tax shifting tools that they have at their disposal to mitigate some of these tax increases um, that the average person would feel. And we, we presented some of that information at our last meeting in January to show how with a debt exclusion, if we were to get a debt exclusion approved, we could mitigate the entire impact of that debt exclusion on all of our resident, primary residential homeowners who, who have, um, who meet the median assessed value in town. And so half of those homeowners, we could completely mitigate the tax levy increase uh, from a debt exclusion by raising the residential exemption, which is currently at 20%, it could go as high as 35%. One last question, uh, and I should research the, the answer to this, but um, I'm going to ask the, the tourist industry, especially in the summer, what is the revenue that is generated from that? And is that something we can look into in order to increase revenues that come to the town? Yeah, where, where we get money from tourists is mainly, you know, rooms and meals taxes. That's, that's, um, that's where most of the revenue comes in for the town anyways, in our coffers. I mean, the local businesses obviously, you know, survive by that. Um, but for the town, we see an increase in our meals taxes and we see an increase in our rooms taxes during that busy part of the year. Um, and we've dedicated all of that to this program. Okay. Mark, I just have a quick question for you. I know the sewer assessment um, got approved at $10,000 um, by the town council, um, but I understand it's not struck in stone. Should we be making a suggestion to review that on an annual basis um, to potentially increase that to what our original um, suggestion was of thirteen thousand? That's built in the uh, into the ordinance, Wendy. Um, the town council has the option to make an adjustment to that. Okay. Sentence. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we could just include that suggestion in our report. Um, to review that um, and possibly make adjustments to that. Yes. And and would the idea, Wendy, be that if we were to make that suggestion that the initial people who's who hooked up to the sewer would pay one assessment and then subsequent hookups would pay more? That's the implication, right? Yeah, I don't think you can go back and charge people more. No. No. But for, no. for future hookups? Yeah. The idea and behind it was that, you know what, uh, the first people to get sewer assessments, of course, they're, they're capped at $10,000. But 10 years from now, as we build out the public sewer system, a $10,000 assessment is a worth it. This, you know, isn't right. worth as That's right. Yeah. Right. Right. And so to try to keep up with inflation, yeah. it was into the ordinance to have that assessment increased annually by a construction cost um, and inflationary factor. And right. So, so, so build in some kind of cola to, and Wendy, I think that's a, that's a great idea that we should consider. That would be a very good suggestion to include that um, the town, that <clears throat> the inflationary factor needs to be considered as we move forward with the uh, assessment. Yeah, so right. it's in the ordinance. They are they have taken that into consideration. It's in their okay. ordinance. And so annually, if a counselor wants to make an adjustment to that, that, that the ordinance provides a mechanism for them to do that. Yeah. So, so it's already in there. It's already in there. Okay. And following up Jackie's question about 
about increasing um, from getting increased revenue from tourists. Um, are the rooms tax and the meals tax set in stone, and could those not be increased? I think I think they'd be pretty. Those are pretty elastic. People are just going to pay whatever they're going to pay. Yeah, the, the thing is, Hector, is those are um, those were passed through general legislation, so they they apply That's to right. everybody across right. the state, state communities, the same rate. So uh, if we need to single out Cape communities, we first of all we already have by creating the Cape and Islands Water Protection Fund. Right. So in addition to the six percent local rooms tax, there's also an additional two point seven five percent rooms right. tax. The Cape and Islands Water Protection Fund assesses. Okay. Uh, people, tourists pay 8.75% rooms tax um, if they come to Cape Cod, which is higher than, you know, most other communities. I think Boston. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the town able to assess its own fee on like a short-term rental? Just no, we do, have a we do have a short-term rental now. Yeah, those taxes, those local rooms taxes and the Cape and Islands Water Protection Fund tax all apply to short-term rentals as well. Right. And so the Cape, what the Cape and Islands Water Protection Fund does is they provide subsidy awards annually to Cape communities for the sewer projects. We submit our projects to them as well. And annually, they've been providing subsidy awards. And so the first round, they've, they've, they've awarded about $30 million in subsidies so far. But, you know, Yarmouth has a $250 million project next year that they're submitting to town meeting this, this spring. Um, right. Ours has, you know, $35 million of projects. Uh, uh, and then Chatham has tens of millions of more. So, it, again, it's, it's, you know, 15 communities competing for a limited pool of funding um, that the Cape and Islands Water Protection Fund has, that the State Republic Loan Fund has. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's, it's still not enough to get that state and federal commitment to 50 percent we're not seeing right. that part. right so is is part. the is the town itself able able to levy another fee like that just on barnstable short-term rentals not currently um we have discussed with state officials affording the idea of doubling the meals tax um, just for this area, if that's something that they would entertain, and we think it'd be a pretty light legislative lift uh, for the state legislature to consider doing something like that. And, you know, it's 0.75% right now, the local meals tax. If you double that, it'd be a $1.50 on a $100 restaurant bill. And right. you guys, Hector said, it's, I, I, you know, it's so elastic. People, I don't think they'll think about it. I mean, when, we, when the local meals tax went into play, Years ago, at 0.75%, there wasn't a lot of outcry from the restaurant industry. Um, there, initially, we heard a few comments, but once it, once it's in place, people just pay it. Right. Yeah. But I think Jackie's point is well taken. Uh, I think others have made it as well that, you know, we should all collectively continue to brainstorm how to, how to get additional revenue in support of the CWMP. But, you know, I, I salute the town having started to plan for this 13, 14 years ago. That's amazing. Yeah, and if you got, you know, really, really what we need to brainstorm is how do we get the state and federal government to commit for this? Because, you know, exactly. you know they, 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 they provided about half the funding. Our understanding is they provided about half the funding to the MWRA when they created that uh, water resource authority and you know we're just looking to be treated the same and but they haven't they haven't come up with the funding yet yeah so when you say we're, we're looking for the state and the federal government to to commit you're saying that they should take away some funds from schools or transportation or, or what have you and dedicate no, we're saying take it away from anybody we're just saying make an investment Make an investment in in state revolving loan fund. You got all this bill money, ARPA money. Put some of it in the state revolving loan fund so we can get twenty five percent subsidies on our projects. You know, we, we we're not getting any subsidies on these on these loans that we're taking out. Right, them. right. We can get a twenty five percent subsidy um, on these projects. You know that that could go a long way to helping us implement our plan without having to raise property taxes any further. 
it would be a lower debt exclusion increase in that case. So if the money isn't being allocated, where is it going? Housing, transportation, right? Um, you know, uh, other other social programs that the state has. Um, so, you know, so Mark, you go on the website and they actually have a. Uh, there's an area on there. I can I can try to find it for you that shows you how the state has allocated all their federal dollars that they received from ARPA and Bill. What would be, so it'd be a, a mass.gov website of some sort? Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you could find that link, I, I think, you know, I think it's, I'll, I for one would like to explore that. Okay. But it's a matter of pressuring the state. I assume we get help from Senator Sear and Kip Diggs and people like that. But at the end of the day, it's it's a process of persuasion, right? It is. I mean, they, they're wrestling with a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of projects at, the, at their own level. I mean, Com just competing the, priorities. Yeah, that's correct. And, in, 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 you know, transportation is a huge issue for the greater Boston area. And they may feel that that's a lot more important than Cape Cod's environment. And so they're going to put more money towards that as opposed to helping us fund the sewer expansion program. And yet it's a federal mandate, as Lillian um, talked about in her paper. Unfunded. It's definitely driven by regulators, that's for sure. That's right. Yeah. Regulatory driven process. Lillian, I think it might be helpful to send Chris your your paper on federal unfunded. I, I did. I did. Okay. She did. Okay. I took a look at it. Great. All, all the members have it, and Paula has it, and uh, Betty Lutke has it, and our congressman has it, as well as my friend on the uh, Reform and Overview Committee of the House, because they're basically looking at. Um, a better handle of unfunded mandates and the financial challenges that they pose to states and municipalities. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's a it's a primer of the CWMP. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was very good, Lillian. Thanks for sending it. Oh, you're cool. very welcome. It's everything you wanted to know <laughs> <laughs> or didn't. <laughs> Great to ask. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Thank you, Mark. Um, one last thing, you were wanted to talk about the bonds, the bond market. Yes. Um, so last last week we conducted a sixteen million dollar bond sale um, through the municipal bond market. These are projects that um, you know the, the improvements to our school facilities, our municipal facilities, uh, waterways. Um, various sewer and water projects that weren't approved for financing through the state revolving loan fund. So we have to issue general obligation bonds for these. Um, and we conducted that bond sale last week. Um, again, $16 million. We had 10 bidders, which was some of the highest interest that we've seen. We competitively bid these bonds. And we had 10 bidders um, bid on those bonds last week with the winning bid coming in at 3.25%. Um, just the, the interest cost uh, over the life of the bonds. There's five-year, 10-year, 15-year, and 20-year maturities um, in that bond structure. Um, so considering the market these days for general obligation bonds, was it was very good. competitive and it was a very good result for the town. Um, prior to issuing that bond, we had to have a, a rating assigned to it. We um, had a meeting with Standard & Poor's um, rating agency, and they reaffirmed the town's AAA bond rating for this particular debt issue, as well as all of the bond, town's outstanding bonds. They reaffirmed as AAA rated. Um, so they do that every year. We, we, we have to have a rating assigned to any new issue um, that we do conduct and they, they also take that opportunity to assign any rating to outstanding debt because our, our bonds could be traded on any given day out in the market someplace. And so 
um, they're kind of, they always have a rating assigned to them. So the good news is that we kept we kept the AAA bond rating, and I think that helped us achieve the the result that we that we got because we we typically use the ten year Treasury as the benchmark for what we anticipate our borrowing cost to be, and I think that was around three point seven percent. Oh, you did well. We came in at three point two five. So that's really good. It's a good sale and a lot of interest. A lot of interest. Ten again, ten bidders. And then they're so close. They're so close. I think I sent, I emailed the result, the bid bond, the bid results. Um, and they, um, you know, that the, it's just, it, it's, it, it's fractions of a, of a, of an interest rate uh, difference between the winning and losing bids. Was it, open, was it a closed? Um, uh, were they, was it closed or was it open? Did they all know what they were bidding against or? What, yeah, was they, it, yeah, it, it is a, I believe the process is a closed bid process. They all, but they can submit multiple bids. They can continue to fine tune their bids. I think it's like a half an hour window that they have. And these underwriters go through this complicated process where they, they play with premiums to adjust the interest rates um, that they end up, um, pay, we end up paying. And, and, and at the end of that time period, once it's up, they close the bids and whoever had submitted the, the lowest bid at that point in time wins. Okay. And, and some of those bidders, were they new to the bond market? So for example, I see TD Securities in there, JP Morgan, are they, have they been bidders? Uh, They've been in the past. And paper and, yeah. They've been in the past. I, I recognize most of the names on there. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think I've seen all of these um, companies bid on our bonds at some point in the past. Excellent. But never all, never had it 10. It's, I think 10 is the most we ever saw. Really? Which is pretty good competition when you got that many vendors bidding for your, your business. Would, would the town consider having some of its residents bid on its bonds, not at um, just probably fractions of those bonds or? Is it just going to be the entire thing for the large companies? It's the large companies that bid on these, Jackie. Yeah. So, I mean, if I've had residents ask me if they can buy a town of Barnstable bond, well, you, you could, but you'd have to go through one of these companies like okay. uh, Fidelity or Piper Jaffrey to buy the bond through, through them. We, we, we don't sell bonds directly to the public. We're not allowed to do that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions about the bonds? Um, I guess, Mark, I did have one question. I, I read through S&P's analysis pretty carefully. Um, do, do you anticipate the rating agencies will view the town's finances to be stressed um, increasingly in coming years by, this, by the sewer projects? Potentially, yes. Um, again, if we... If we are forced to continue with the implementation of this program with no additional property tax um, increase to help pay for that, our budget flexibility is going to go down. Yeah, right? Right. Sure. If we have $10 million in fixed loan payments right now, yeah. and that doubles to $20 million in five years, that's a big change in our budget flexibility because that's a fixed cost that we can't cut. We have to make those bond right. payments every single right. year. Um, so yeah, and if we don't, so if we can't, usually bond rating agencies look at, um, local, locally approved property tax levy increases that are done through override votes. For example, the uh, bond rating agencies look at upon that as favorable uh, to them. It says the community supports raising property taxes to pay for these things to maintain their budget flexibility and to provide a quality service. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's when communities continually get shot down, they're asking for tax levy increases to pay for things, and then they have to cut services and redirect those monies to that service. That can be, that can signal a problem for that community and potentially a downgrade in your rating. Yeah, because I, I looked and the word wastewater appears once in the S&P report, and I would have expected them to have focused on it a little bit more. When you met with them, did they ask many questions about CWMP? 
Yeah, they're, you know, I mean, they're well aware of our seed. They do, they're well aware of it. We've provided them, you know, our yeah. capital improvement plan. Um, we've reviewed our funding plan in the past with them for this program. They feel it's manageable what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be watching closely if we do not, uh, if we go forward with the implementation and, and if we don't get tax levy increases authorized to pay for that, they're going to be watching that closely and mm -hmm. sure that will become a concern for them at some point that um, we're losing our budget flexibility. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Anybody have any other questions or comments? Yeah, I had one question. I believe uh, um, Mark mentioned there's a school meeting presentation on Wednesday or something. Can I school get that? Meeting right? Wednesday night. Yes. Um, is that? Do you know if that's online or? Is... You will be. I think you will be able to watch it um, via Channel 18 or Channel 22. You can check the the public posting, but it's live. The meeting's going to be live. Okay, thanks. Um, but you might be able to watch it on channel 18 or 22, depending on what channel you're broadcasting it on. <clears throat> Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Um, as you found out from Mark's briefing, it is our job to make sure that he stays healthy and well, because <laughs> it not only is he the financial brain trust for our for our committee, but he's also the financial brain trust for the town of Barnstable. So it is in our vested interest that uh, Mark stays well. Should we bring him chicken soup? We could bring him chicken <laughs> soup or whatever else he wants. Yeah, yeah. Mark Mark used the R word when he uh, introduced <laughs> himself, and I I was a little bit scared by that. Yeah, you don't you don't have any plans to implement the R strategy, Mark? Do you? Yeah, that's right. No, no I'm good. Well, and you know, there's there's Gareth Markwell sitting in the wings here as the as the new assistant. Yeah, I, you know, you might be seeing Gareth attend more of our meetings in the future. Um, good. To speed with uh, what this committee does. Yeah, uh, he's taking on a, a more of the responsibilities uh, on the municipal side of our operation coming from the schools. Um, yeah. And um, I think this would it would be a good um, for him to get to know you all and to understand what this committee does. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there is there any uh, indication of um, the number? whether we will be able to uh, reinstate in-person meetings? So there was a bill filed recently um, that will allow this format to continue through March of 2025. Ah, oh, excellent. Um, has been approved yet, but we anticipate it will be approved by the end of this month. So if the committee wants to continue to meet via Zoom, we should be able to have the ability to do so. But Understand that if you want to go back to in-person meetings, we can do that anytime. Just let me know. Right. Okay. We can we can, we can meet in town hall or school administration building or someplace right. else. Yeah. In the evenings. Yeah. Well, well, we, can, we can't do. We can't. We, we're not set up to do hybrid. Uh, we can't have some of you in person and some of you right. um, via Zoom. It has to be one way or the other. But just let me know how yeah. you want to. Meet. It will right, be nice. But, it will be nice to meet again in person at some point in time, and perhaps in the spring, uh, we can think about it. Right. Well, I we we talked. Excuse me, Lillian. So we talked about this issue a while back, and I was a proponent of meeting in person again. And I think everybody else, um, I think most other people, were happy with the Zoom. Mark, yeah. I take your point that we can't do a hybrid. Right. some zoom some in person um but i for one would would be supportive of meeting in person if other members of the committee mm -hmm. were interested in in doing it as you say lillian perhaps in the spring yes and well you know as as you remember we were uh, perilously close in membership in terms of getting a quorum but mm -hmm. now that, now that we have a little bit more breathing room Mm -hmm. uh, we can take into account many of our members are 
are planning travels in the next couple of months or so. Mm-hmm. So if we have if we have sufficient numbers, uh, we can begin to think about it in the spring. Okay, good. Okay. Neil, I just looked at the school committee's uh, agenda posting. They're, they're meeting at town hall starting at 530. They'll be in the council hearing room. So that meeting will be broadcast on channel 18. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Is there any other business to come before the committee? Not hearing any. Is there a uh, motion to adjourn? I move. Is there a second? I second. Seconded. Chuck, will you call the roll, please? Well, uh, Lillian? Yes. Jackie? Yes. Wendy? Yes. Neil? Yes. Chris? Yes. Hector? Yes. And Chuck is yes. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Mark, for the